Hello class, welcome back. Today we're going to go ahead and continue on module F, right? It's gonna be homework F. And in this section, we're going to go ahead and cover um, section 4.2, uh, 4.3, and then 4.4. So let's go ahead and get started, right? Let's go ahead and jump right into it, right? So the, the formula we're gonna be using for this section, right? Linear approximations and differentials, right? Specifically near linear, approxim uh, linear approximation, we're gonna be using that formula, right? This is a formula you wanna get um, used to or you want to go ahead and memorize in the event that, you know, you may be on the exam and you don't, and you don't remember, you'll see that this formula is very, very similar to something we've been using before, all right? Um, this formula here would be y minus y1 is equal to m x minus x1, right? The equation of a line. And, and that's all it is, right? That's all it is. If we get the equation of the line and we solve for y, right? We get y is equal to y1 is, um plus slope times x minus x1, all right? We, we know that, right, whenever we're graphing, right, and you're giving a point, it belongs to these values here, all right? Right, uh, you can say this value is a, and then you can say this value is whenever you plug in a into the equation, all right? So, so a would be the, the x value, of course, right? And how do you get the y? Well, you plug it in into the original equation, right? So that's what that is, all right? And, and we know, right? We've been learning in class that slope is just the same thing as take a, a derivative, right? It's a derivative, but at that specific x value, right? And, and if you notice, if you make the proper substitutions I just mentioned, it gives you this exact equation, all right? So sure, it may look a little bit different, but it's something we're right we're used to already seeing, right? And like I said, um, use the equation of the line if for some reason you you forget, right? Uh, um, so let's go ahead and get started, right? Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, use linear approximation, i.e., the tangent line, to approximate what is the square root of sixty four point one, right? Um, and Right, this information here, that's a plus because that's given to you, but that's not always going to be given to you, right? And that's fine, right? You can go ahead and decipher everything just from this part here, right? Just from that part there, right? So, so, so whenever you're dealing with these, you're going to look at the value of what you're asking, what they're asking you to approximate, and you're going to be able to get the parent function out of that just by looking at it, right? Hey, I see that's the square root of a number. I know that the parent function has to be the square root of x. Similarly, right? If it was q root of, if they say, hey, find me q root of 26.9, right? Hey, to start off with, I know that my parent function is the q root of x, All right? So the goal here is gonna be to identify the, the parent function, right? So that's step number one. A, right? is going to be the value inside, right? It's going to be the value inside the square root, right? From the original part you were given, right? And that's going to be the closest value you, you know the square root of, right? Um, 64.1, well, I know what the square root of 64 is. That's a very nice number, right? That is eight, right? So in other words, your A value here would be eight. Let's go back here to this example, right? The A value here would be 27 because the Q root of 27 is um, three, correct? Right, and another quick little example, right? If you were given uh, 24.8, the square root of 24.8, right? You know that your parent function would be the square root of X and you know that your A value would be, well, the closest one is gonna be 25, right? Because I know the square root of 25, all right? Uh, so th those are gonna be two things you're gonna need. You're gonna need your F, right? You're gonna need A, right? And at this point, I have pretty much everything that I need, right? Oh, I'm sorry, it's not actually eight, it's 64, I'm sorry. It's 64, right? I wrote eight there because the, the square root of 
uh, 64 was 8, all right? So the A value there is 64. So what I'm going to go ahead and do now, right? If we go ahead and go ahead and get these notes out of here. If you go ahead and look at this, I have my function, right? I can plug in A into there and I know what that is. I have my A part, which I already found. Hmm. I need to find the derivative and that's easy, right? We, we know how to take the derivative of this function, right? Uh, the derivative of this function, right? Well, we need to go ahead and rewrite some stuff, right? We know this is x to the one over two. And hey, right from what we learned from exam one is I can apply the power rule here, right? So my derivative, right, is going to be one over two x to the one half minus one, right? And when you, right, when you go ahead and solve that, right? And as we progress with the class, I'm gonna be doing all these steps, right? Uh, we find out that my derivative is, uh, all right, let's go ahead and finish solving the, this part here, right? So this is, 2x to the negative one half, right? You don't want a negative exponent, right? So this is one over two x to the one half, right? Meaning this is just one over two square root of x, right? One over two square root of x. If you want to go ahead and pause the video and work that out, definitely go ahead, right? Definitely go ahead. Right, so at this point, I have everything that I need. I have my a value, I have my function, and I have the derivative of my function. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and plug everything into here, all right? I'm gonna need, I have my function, right, which is square root of x. So I'm gonna do that function with 64 in it, all right? Plus the derivative of that function with a in it, right? So that's gonna be one over um, two square root of 64 times, all right, times, let's see here, x minus, right, x minus, and that part there is going to be a, right, which is going to be 64. Very, very nice. And fixing this up here, all right, oh, I forgot to write, love it, is equal to that, right? So, so I have this so far, right? And let me go ahead and clean this up, right? Let's go ahead and clean this up. So my linear approximation, all right, is the square root of 64 is eight plus one over two times eight. That's gonna give me 16, um, x minus 64, all right? And at this point it's just algebraic manipulation, right? I'm gonna go ahead and plug, uh, distribute that into there, all right? So this here is going to be eight plus x over 16, Minus how many times does 64 going to six? Uh, how many times does uh, 16 going to 64? Right, uh, we know that is four times. All right, and last but not least, right, I can go ahead and combine those like terms, meaning by the my linear approximation for any x value, right, it's going to be x over 16 uh, plus four. Gonna be exactly that, right? But it's gonna be pretty close to it, right? It's gonna be pretty, pretty close to it. All right. So, and if we and if we go back to the original question, right? They wanted me to take uh, approximate the square root of sixty four point one, right? So now that I got this approximation, right? I'm gonna go ahead and plug in sixty four point one into that right, to this linear function, right? And this here, it's going to end up giving me, right, when I plug it into my calculator, right, this is going to be 8.00625, right? Eight point zero zero six two five, right? And, all right, you might be saying, hey, what's the, what's the point of this, all right? What's the, what's, what's the purpose of this, all right? Um, yeah, you can just plug this in, right? Uh, the purpose of this is, um, right, I don't know how to take the square root of 64.1. What if I didn't have a calculator, right? Uh, this is what they were using before, all right? Uh, you didn't have a calculator to compute that, but you can get a really close approximation by using linear functions and linear functions, you know, you know, we can, um, we can solve those, right? Even if we had decimals, right? Even if we had decimals, um, you can convert decimals to, to more whole numbers, right? And that's going to go ahead and give me the same value, right? So for example, um, 
64.1 over 16, right? Um, you, you would you would you probably say, hey, oh, how do we even start here, right? Well, 64.1, if I were to multiply this by 10, right? That'll give me, right? What would that give me? What do, in other words, what would it do to that decimal? It'll move it to the right. I don't know if whatever I do to the bottom, right? I need to do to the top, right? So in other words, this here gives me this. And hey, right? I can I can do this by hand, right? This is uh, all right. This is old school. We used to do this in um, in like an elementary, right? Middle school, all right. Um, but it's much better, right, than trying to do the square root of 64.1, right? So, right, doing the linear approximation of 64.1 gave me this, right? If you were to go ahead and plug in the square root of 64.1 into your calculator, right? Square root of 64.1 into your calculator, this ends up giving me 8.0062. Uh, let's, let's do all the decimals, right? Uh, four, seven, five, six. Hey, I would say that is pretty darn close. All right. Even if you were to round up to five decimal points, right? Um, if you were to round up to here, right? That'll turn it into a five, right? It, it's pretty close, right? They're pretty much identical up to, up to there, right? So now we see here the benefits of linear approximation, right? So if you ever stranded, stranded in an island, and you don't have your calculator with you and you need to find a linear approximation of something, there you go, right? There you go, okay? Um, you're right, in this section, you're gonna be giving other problems, all right? You're gonna go ahead and be giving other problems, um, right? I'm gonna go ahead and give you a function and I'm going to say, hey, I want you to find a change in Y, in other words, delta Y, when X is this value and when your delta X is this value, all right? The, the key word here is change, right? Find the change, right? And by find the change, right? Of course, there's gonna be a formula associated with, with this, right? There's gonna be a formula associated with that. And of course, right, I wrote them up there, but let's go ahead and write them out again, all right? The, your, the formula that you're gonna use for change, right? It's going to be delta y is equivalent to the function of x plus delta x minus the function at x. All right, so let's go ahead and see what they're asking us here, right? And, and please have your calculator handy, right, for these problems, right? Have your calculator handy by your side, all right? Uh, let's get you used to using our calculator, right? Um, so I see here they want me to find delta y, right? So boom, uh, I know that's what I have to, that's what I would have to find, right? Um, I'm told here, so let's write out what, what I know, right? Uh, for this part, I know that my function is to be x squared. I know that my x is equal to one and that my delta x is equal to 0 0.3, right? I, I, from, from here, or from these two, right? Um, I need to find f of x plus delta x, right? So in other words, this is f of, one plus 0 0.3 minus f at one, right? So in other words, this is gonna be my function at 1.3 minus my function at one. That's gonna give me that delta y, right? And what do you do? Well, you already have your function, right? So it's only, it's plug and play, right? So here, this is gonna be three times 1.3 squared minus, F at one, right? So that's gonna be three times one squared, all right? Let's go ahead and plug that in. Let me see what you all get, all right? You should, for this one, right? You should get delta Y, all right? Is equal to zero, um, 2.07, right? 2.07, right? So the keyword here is find the change in Y, right? And that was the change in Y. All right, I may ask you, right? You may end up noticing the, the same question is probably asking, find the differentiable, right? Find the differential, right? And you know differentials, right? We went over in class, right? That dy over dx is equal to f prime of x, right? It's, it's a definition, right? And this is what we're gonna use here, all right? I'm told here for this second part 
that I need to find dy, right? So this is my unknown. Uh, my x is one, my dx is 0 0.3, all right? So in other words, let me go ahead and move this around to where I have dy by itself, all right? I have dy by itself. So in other words, I'm gonna multiply both sides by dx, right? That's all I'm doing. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply both sides by dx dx and this here is going to give me dy is equal to f prime of x times dx all right so i have dx all right i have dx ah but i need to find the derivative of my function right so let's go ahead and get the derivative right uh my function is 3x squared so f prime of x is going to be what 6x right and even further, right, if I want to know what f prime at 1 is, at the x that they gave me, this is just 6 times 1, meaning f prime at 1 is just 6, right? Oh, so this is just plug and play, right? All you're really going to go ahead and plug in is this and this, all right? And I may change it up on you, right? I may say, hey, I want you to find the differentiable dx, all right? And that means you would, you're right, you would move things the other way, right? And solve for dx, meaning this here is dy is equal to 6 times 0 0.3, right? And we find out that when I compute this, this here ends up giving me approximately 1.8, right? So 1.8. All right, so just keep an eye out on these, right? Keep an eye out on those between change and differential. And last but not least, right? Say, hey, I'm giving you a function. My delta x equals this, right? My delta x is 0 0.2, all right? I also know that uh, at x equals 4, use linear approximations to estimate what delta y is, right? And for this, uh, it's going to be very similar to what we did here before, right? Specifically, you'll notice that we're dealing with delta x and delta y again, but it's specifically asking for a linear approximation, right? If you notice here, the word linear approximation was not included here, right? But it's still going to be the same thing, right? It's still going to go ahead and, right, and be the same thing, the right? My delta y over my delta x. Right, it's just a different version of this, right? Is equal to the derivative of that x value, all right? Okay, so if I gotta find delta y, right? So, because I'm told here that my function is given, right? Um, I'm told that my delta x is 0 0.2, um, delta y is what I'm trying to solve for, and that my x is equal to four, right? So let me go ahead and solve for delta y. Hey, this is very similar to the other one, right? Delta y is equal to f prime of x uh, times delta x. All right. Hey, similar, similar to before, right? Let's let's go ahead and find the derivative of my function. All right. All right. We know that this derivative is just going to be eight x plus seven. All right. Um, so this means f at the given x, which is four. This is going to be eight times four plus seven. Right. So what does that give me? This gives me thirty-nine. All right. So this here is just thirty-nine. So again, what am what am I going to be using? I'm going to be using this. All right, not that middle part. Right, that's inter my intermediate steps, and my delta x. Right, which was this, and that's going to give me this approximation. Right, this is an approximation. Uh, so therefore, this delta y approximation is approximately 39 times 0 0.2, right? And this ends up being roughly 7.8. Okay, so, so pretty straightforward, right? Linear approximation, right? And of course, there's going to be some word problems in there, right? There's going to be some word problems in there. Um, th the same idea, right? It's in the, you're going to be doing the same thing, finding approximations, um, if you need help with those, right? If you're you're not quite sure, I recommend you watch the video. I have linked to it, right? Um, so it's a great explanation with the graph and so forth, right? So, 
here we move on to uh, probably another one of my favorite sections, right? So deriving in general is, is awesome, right? The little mini puzzles. But also graphing um, in calculus, it's awesome. It's amazing, all right? It's awesome, um, right? Because you may you, you might you may ask yourself like, man, like how am I, how am I gonna graph, right? You need a calculator? No, you don't, right? You really don't need a calculator. All you need is time, and right with calculus, it, it ends up being pretty straightforward. I actually think it's even easier to graph than it is in college algebra, right? In college algebra, um, we learn how to find like vertex, right? So we were really only dealing with one critical point and I'll go ahead and explain what a critical point is, right? Um, right, but, but I, I think it's it, it's fun, right? It, it's fun. So let's go ahead and jump right straight, straight, jump straight to it, right? So in this section and in a few sections right on forward, we're gonna be dealing a lot with extrema. All right, which are extreme are just going to be, hey, are you dealing with a maximum or minimum? Right, we're going to deal with a maximum or minimum. Uh, another name for that is critical points, right? So that's the one I'm going to be using the, the most. So whenever I say critical points, what your mind should go to is, am I talking about a minimum or am I talking about a maximum, right? All right, and I know in college, um, in college algebra, we call these vertex, right? We end up calling that a vertex. But as you notice, we're doing the same thing in college algebra, but just with well, with new definitions, right? And new rules, right? So, basics, right? Uh, I have this function, right? And I want to find the critical points, right? So I know. There's a critical point here, and there's a critical point there, right? So in other words, this is a critical point approximately at x equals negative two, and there's a critical point at, I would say, x equals one half, right? X equals one half. Why do we care about critical points? Uh, one thing that I would tell you to update your definitions on is critical points determine where a graph begins or where it ends in terms of increasing or decreasing, right? Uh, your graph may be increasing. Once it hits a critical point, it can decrease, all right? So in other words, right? And you always wanna read these from left to right, right? So you're going here, you're going down, this graph is decreasing up into that point right there, right? And you determine these in terms of X values, right? So in other words, this is decreasing from negative infinity to negative two, right? And then it starts, it changes. It starts increasing from here to here, right? It changes direction, it starts increasing from, in terms of x between negative two and one half. And then at the critical point again, what does it do? It starts decreasing, it changes direction again, right? In other words, it, it um, it's now decreasing again from one half to infinity, right? And so that's one of the properties from critical points, right? That's one of the properties from critical points. And yes, critical points are the X values, right? They are specifically the X values. Right. So how do you find these, right? Using calculus, right? How do you find these, right? And remember, always remember, you're in a calc, we're in calculus one, right? So when in doubt, take the first derivative, right? So let's just say that we get to the exam, we're completely stumped, we had a, something came up, right? We didn't have enough time to study. When in doubt, take the derivative, right? Um, that's gonna at least gain you some partial points rather than no points at all, right? So let me jump straight to it, right? You're giving a function and I'm asking you to find the critical numbers, right? The critical numbers. Your critical numbers are going to be, right? When you get the derivative and you equal it to zero and you solve for those X values, right? So first off, let me find the derivative to this. All right, here ends up giving me, 8x squared minus, was that, 54. Yeah, very nice, 54 plus 48. Okay, 
the next thing you're going to do is you're going to get that derivative and you're going to equal it to zero. Okay. So you use, in other words, you're going to get this and equal it to zero, and you're going to solve for these x values, right? You're going to go ahead and solve for these x values, right? Again, this is where your college algebra skills come into play, right? So let's go ahead and I know I can factor out an eight from all of these. Ooh, let's see here that this does not factor right um, oh i see what it did wrong i'm so sorry um that's not an eight right i see here this here is i'm sorry this here is 6x squared minus 54x plus 48 all right i, I apologize right so we go ahead and get this right here it to zero. All right, I'm going to put an equal to zero. And then I know I can try to factor out a, a six, right? There we go. There we go. Right. Nice. All right. And at this point, right, you can you really should only focus on the inside, right? You really should only focus on this inside part. Right. Um, if you're wondering why, right? Um, what if you were to divide both sides by six? Right. Yeah, that's just a coefficient in the front, right? So all you're really left with is this. Right. You know, by doing the AC method, right? The AC method, right? Um, in case we forgot, right? I'm looking for two values that multiply. Well, we know in front of this x squared is a one, right? A times C gives me one times eight, which is eight. And B, right? B is just my middle value. That's gonna be negative nine. I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give me positive eight. But whenever I sum those same two values, they give me negative nine. Um, and you find out that negative one and negative eight is possible, right? This means, this factors down to x minus one times x minus eight is equal to zero. We apply the zero product property, right? This here gives me x minus one is equal to zero. And x minus eight is equal to zero, meaning x is equal to one and whew, x is equal to eight, right? So this means with this function here, I have a maximum or a minimum at these two points at x equals one and x equals eight. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to this next section, right? We're gonna be asked to find not only the critical numbers, but I'm also gonna have to determine, hey, is this a maximum or a minimum? And you might be asking, like, how am I going to determine that? Well, it's going to be pretty straightforward, right? What we're going to apply here, it's what's known as the first derivative test. And remember, this is only a test. Okay, this is only a test. All right. This is a, a test. And it's, it's a test. And there's a reason why, why my emphasis is on tests. All right. Um, so again, you're given a function and you need to find the critical numbers, right? The critical points. Well, we know, right? Hey, when in doubt, take the first derivative, right? That's all we're really doing in this class. All right, well, for some part, right? Um, have here there 20 x to the fourth minus 20 x to the third plus 60 x squared, right? Okay, I know I need to go ahead and equal it to zero. Right, what can I factor out? Hey, I can factor out a, let me factor out a negative x squared, right? Negative x squared, actually, let me factor more than that. Let me factor out a negative 20 x squared, right? Let's bring out all those coefficients out there. So I'm left with an x squared in the front. On uh, the inside, it was a negative, but I took something negative out. So it's gonna be a positive. I took the 20 out. 
All right, I had I had three, I had X cubed, I took X squared out, meaning I just have one X. And at the end, I should only have a negative, what does that give me? Negative three, right, negative three. Okay, and just like before, all right? Um, I can, let me go ahead and divide by negative 20 to both sides. So I'm left with uh, x squared times x squared plus x minus three equals zero. Um, what I want to go ahead and apply here is going to be the zero product property, right? So I have x squared is equal to zero, and then I have uh, x squared plus x minus three equals zero. So one of my critical points, all right? I take the square root to both sides. One of my critical points is x equals zero, right? I'll come back to this. How about here? All right, what, what, how do I factor this? Hmm. Can't really apply AC method, right? I can't really apply AC method. So what you have to do is write a little throwback, all right? Uh, when in doubt, x equals negative b, right? Plus or minus the square root. There's that jingle, right? It's kind of cringe right but uh it helps you remember it right so I'll, I'll make that trade right if it's cringe hey that's fine uh as long as it you know gets me some points for the test right so x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a right and of course right in case we forgot or you want to um go through that and have this jingle stuck in your head right you can look up e um what is it, the quadratic formula jingle? Quadratic formula jingle on YouTube, right? And you'll, you'll find a song and listen to it uh, a few times and you'll have it because something like this is expected from you in the next coming exam, so. All right, so let's go ahead and plug that in, right? So in other words, my A is one, my B is one, my C equals negative three. All right, and let's, let's solve this one here together, right? Um, x is equal to negative one plus or minus the square root of one squared minus four, one minus three, all over two a. All right, so this is what I get here. All right, so I get negative one plus or minus the square root of one squared, that's just one. Negative four times one times negative three, all right? That's gonna be a positive, and that's gonna be a positive 12 all over two, all right? So I get here this to be x is equal to negative one plus or minus the square root of 13 all over two, all right? And at this point, I went as far as I can go, but I know I can split that up into two functions, right? Into two equations, this is X is equal to negative one plus square root of 13 over two. And this is X is equal to negative one minus square root of 13 over two. All right, so these are my exact values, right? These, these here would be my exact uh, values, but in case, hey, I wanted us to find, yeah, I want you to approximate these, right? Let's go ahead and approximate these, all right? I would go ahead and plug this into my calculator Right, and you'll see why I'm using my calculator now, right? Divided by two. All right, this gives me 1.303. And this next one here gives me negative 2.303, all right? So these are my critical values, right? These are my critical points, all right? So we're halfway there, all right? We're, we're, we're halfway there. So I know these are, like I said, these are critical points, all right? Um, let's go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and erase this computational part. Ooh, I actually do not want to, where's my derivative? Okay, my derivative is up there, that's fine. So let me go ahead and erase this here, all right? So I have this right here, right? I've gone ahead and put my critical points right next to each other. All right, so this next part is extremely important, all right? I will ask you to do something like this on the exam. So what you're gonna do is, I want you to create a number line. 
I want you to create a number line, all right? So I would say zero, one, two, three, four, And I'm going to mark my critical points, all right? I know these may or, I know these are gonna be my critical points and I'm gonna go ahead and introduce a new term here in a bit, but I want us to see exactly, how I want us to, to find our two different scenarios, right? Or uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different scenarios, all right? And we'll, we'll see, all right? Um, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is mark my roots, right? Mark these critical points. I know this can be a max or a min or something else that the professor keeps hinting at. Uh, 1.3, that's something else, right? And this could be a max or a min or something else that the professor is hinting at and the same thing here, right? So for example, this may look something like like that, all right? Uh, look how I line these up here, right? That's a visual representation of what this can look like. It can also look like, all right, one possibility is it can look like, because it's some extra man, it could look something like this, all right? It could look something, or it can look something like that, right? And that's what we're about to find out, all right? That's what we're about to do. Remember, I mentioned that this is called the first derivative test, all right? And write that derivative over here. Making it really, uh, and the reason I chose this long problem, right, is if you're able to follow and understand this difficult problem, you shouldn't really have, uh, I'm hoping you're having difficulty with the simpler problems, right? So since this is a test, what I need you to do is. I want you to look at this number line and you're gonna choose points to the left and to the right of those critical points and choose a value. So in other words, you want to choose a value in this side, right, on this side. You can, as long as it's negative three or less, or in other words, more specifically, um, as long as it's between that individual, smaller than that individual part, as long as it is less than negative 2.303. Well, I wanna use something pretty close to it. I'll say that. So I'm going to choose negative three, all right? And you're gonna choose these for all these different sides, right? So I'm gonna use negative three there. I'm gonna choose between here and here, I'll do negative one, right? Between the other ones, I'll use positive one. And on the other end, I'll choose a two, all right? So you need to use it to the left and to the right of everything and in, in, in between all of them, all right? And what you're going to go ahead and do now is you're going to go ahead and plug these values into the first derivative, all right? And you're really not focused on the number, you're mainly focused on the sign, whether it's positive or negative. That's gonna be your main concern, okay? That's gonna be our main concern, all right? So let's go ahead and see what happens, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in, um, let's plug in which one? Um, Let's plug in negative three, right? Let's plug in negative three into that first derivative. Into here, right? I'm gonna go ahead and do this on my calculator and I'm gonna go, let's go ahead and do it for all of these, right? Let's go ahead and do it for all of these. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's plug in um, negative three to the first derivative. We'll plug in while we're at it. We'll plug in, we said negative one into the first derivative. We'll plug in F one into the first derivative. And then we'll plug in, we'll plug in two into the first derivative, right? You generally want to use smaller numbers, right? I'm sure you can use 10 if you want, but you know, let's make our lives a little bit easier, all right? So let's go ahead and plug those in and I'll be right back. And we're back, all right? We're back. Uh, you'll see here that I got for F at X equals negative three, I got negative 540, uh, 60, 20, and negative 240 respectively for those X values, right? So, in other words, for f prime of negative three, which gave me negative 540, that was negative, right? And negative, we're going to associate with downward. And positive, we're going to associate with upward, or in other words, decreasing and increasing, right? Ooh, I gotta fix this, All right? So for the value that I chose here to the left of that critical point, right, it was, 
decreasing because it's negative, right? So I'm getting something like this here, right? Um, to the, between negative two and zero, I chose negative one, right? That was positive 60. So this was increasing. All right, between zero and one, it was positive. So it's also increasing. And to the right, my far one, I got negative. So it's decreasing. All right, so a quick sketch, right? Should, could be something like, let's just say, doesn't really matter where those points are at because we're just guesstimating right now, all right? All right, we're just really guesstimating, all right? Uh, but one thing you do know is let's focus on these two parts here. I have a critical point. I know to the left, my graph is decreasing, but on the right, it's increasing. Ah, you just drew the minima. Very nice. All right, there's another critical point here, but something happens. It, be, it is a critical point, but then it keeps increasing. Hmm. Hmm. Right. And then, right at that other value, it's still increasing, right? We're looking at this part here. All right, it's still increasing. It hits that critical point and then it decreases, right? I'm sorry, it decreases. Very nice. So here, all right. Um, so you notice that not every time it's going to be a maximum or a minimum, all right? Um, I've heard some students say this, and I've used it before. I call this a false critical point, all right? Um, where it's not increasing or it's not greasing. It's, it's, it does this. It, it does end up having a, so it does something like this. And I'll show you, right? So my slope at that point is zero, all right? My slope at the point is zero, but let's see, go ahead and see what that looks like, all right? If we see here, right, at, at zero, it does that, right? So it ends up getting a horizontal slope and then it keeps increasing, right? We say there was another critical point at 1.3, right? If I zoom out far enough, right? Hey, I had the other critical point here at negative uh, 2.303, right? Yeah, this is a guesstimate of what my graph looks like, right? And if you notice, I was able to, to graph that just, just with that, right? Just by applying the first derivative test, right? Just by applying the, uh, the, the first derivative test, all right? Uh, you may be asked to do the same thing, but with boundaries, right? You may ask you to go ahead and find the, the same thing, but with boundaries, all right? And I need to go ahead and find my maximum or my minimum, all right? So, okay, let's go ahead and find out, right? So what we're going to be doing with this is going to be the same thing, right? I need to go ahead and find my critical points, right? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and find my critical points, uh, but right, but this graph is going to be a little bit more smaller, right? It's going to be like the previous one where it's pretty large, all right? So when in doubt, you take the first derivative, all right? I'm going to find these critical points. This ends up giving me negative six x, all right? Um, I equal this to zero, and I find out that one critical point is zero. Right. Whenever you have these boundaries, right? Whenever you have these boundaries, this is bounded between negative five and one, right? Meaning you have these walls now. You have created these walls now where your graph is only able to exist within that point. So this means if you had something like this, right? Sure, I have a local minima here, but this is my absolute minimum value right there, all right? Because that one's lower, all right? Because it's cut off, right? It, it ends up being, it could be, it is an extrema at that cutoff point, right? At here, this is also a local maxima, but I end up finding out that this is my absolute maxima, all right? All right. Um, you may end up getting these even if you don't have curves, right? Even if you don't have uh, curves for graphs, right? So let's just say generally your a, a, a line function looks like this, right? But now that you have bounds, right? Let's go back to this one, right? 
here you don't have a maximum or minimum whenever you're dealing with a line because it keeps going on forever. But as soon as you create boundaries, right? There is a mix, a maxima, a minima, and a maxima do exist, right? Because it's cut off and it's something you can locate, right? So this is pretty much what's going on here, right? That's pretty much what's what's going on here, right? I'm gonna want to go ahead and do the first. Uh, let's see what do I have here. So I know I have. All right, I have zero, one, two, three. All right, so if these are my bounds, here and here, the only really values I need to go ahead and plug in, right, to see which one's higher than the other one is negative five, right, which are and one, which are the bounds. You're always going to plug those in. All right, and I'm going to plug in the critical point that I found, which was zero. All right. So generally with these boundary ones, what you want to go ahead and do is if you have a function, if you have this graph, remember, as if you have an x point, you can always know the y part of it by plugging it in into the original equation, into the original equation, right? Into the original equation, all right? Um, so if you wanted to go ahead and apply what we did earlier, right? Um, hey, I wanna know if it's increasing or decreasing at this critical point, right? So I'm gonna choose a point to the left of this, somewhere here, right? I'm gonna choose negative one the first derivative test, All right? So this is negative one, six is positive. So I know between here and here, this is gonna be increasing up to there. And the only point between zero and one, that's gonna be what, a half, right? Um, right, you can even say um, at one over two, right? F prime at one over two. Uh, you plug that in into the first derivative. This is negative six. Um, maybe negative three. That's a negative value. So I know. Uh, so our, you see, I already know that at x equals zero, that's going to be a maxima. All right. I already know just uh, by the first derivative test that that right there is going to go ahead and be a maxima. All right. So let's go ahead and find out what this ends up giving me. All right. All right, so like I said, if you want to know the exact y values of that maximum, you plug that in into your original equation. So I'm going to plug in f of negative 5 into the original equation. All right, this is going to be give me 2 minus 3 negative 5 squared, which is does that give me two minus three times 25, All right? This is two minus 75, this is negative 73. Well, that's a pretty low value, right? So in other words, at that boundary, whenever X is equal to negative five, my Y is equal to negative 73. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in, what do I want to plug in now? The other critical point, zero. Right, f of zero into my original equation. Right, we end up finding out that gives me. Is it zero? Yes, at zero. Right, you plug in zero into there, and that gives me two. So that means whenever x is equal to zero, this is two. And we'll go ahead and plug in the last critical point, which is one. Right, this is. S here ends up giving me two minus three, which is uh, negative one, meaning one negative one is my point, all right? So in other words, negative five, negative 73, ooh, that's when we're down there. Zero two is here, and then one negative one is there. 
So my graph does something like this. Like that, right? And it doesn't continue to the left or to the right because it, it's bounded between negative five and one. It cannot go to the left and it cannot go to the right of that. And here, right, I looked, hey, I knew this was going to be a, a, a maxima, right? We determine that too with the first derivative test, right? Right, so I know that I have in, right, this is low, but this is lower, all right? So my abs, my absolute minimum is the y coordinate, which is going to be negative 73 at x is equal to negative five. My local minimum is the y part, which is negative one at the x value as x equals one. And my absolute uh, maxima, my abs max, is two at x equals zero. So you now you see the beautiful part of calculus, right? Um, how you're able to graph without, with just deriving, right? With just, just deriving. And there's more, all right? Um, there's more, all right? Uh, of course, right? You're gonna do the same thing, right? We're, we're, just, we're gonna go ahead and do, do the same thing, right? Uh, it's g of theta equals two theta minus six sine of theta, right? Uh, I know thetas may seem off to some of us, but hey, at the end of the day, this is just y is equal to two x minus six sine of x. That's all it is, right? That's all it is, right? And just get, let's just get used to solving it with thetas, right? So taking the derivative of this, g prime of theta, this is going to be two minus six cosine theta, right? Right, how do I find my critical points, right? You equal this to zero, okay? You're gonna go ahead and equal this to zero, all right? So this here, all right? This here is gonna be two, two minus six, Cosine of theta to zero. I'm going to subtract two to both sides. So I get negative six. Cosine of theta is equal to negative two. Divide both sides by negative six. So this here gives me cosine of theta is equal to one over, what's that? One over three, All right? One over three. And at this point, all right, so uh, what do you think we should do? Yes, that is correct, right? So what we're going to go ahead and do here is do inverse cosine, right? We can do inverse cosine, right? Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take inverse cosine to both sides. All right, so this here is going to be cosine. No, because they cancel out. These two cancel out, meaning theta is equal to inverse cosine of one over three. All right, let's go ahead and plug that in. All right, let's go ahead and plug that in. All right, let's go ahead and get our calculator. What does that end up giving me? All right, and we see here, all right, in that whenever you're be sure with this with these that your calculator is in radians right the theta that ends up getting i get from here is theta is approximately 1.23 right 1.23 okay one thing that we know is all students take calculus right from trig meaning all my trig functions are positive here only sine and its inverse are positive here. Everything else is negative. In quadrant three, only tangent and its inverse is positive. All right, and that cos uh, cosine and its inverse are only positive here. All right, so I know that for inverse cosine, right, it only exists in these two quadrants, right? It only exists in those two quadrants. 
right? But if you noticed, right, the value that we got is always going to be, it's, it's always given in quadrant one, right? Um, it's always given in quadrant one, right? Meaning if I wanted to find, if I wanted to find what cosine is in quadrant four, what do I have to do in terms of radians, right? Right. Well, we know that in terms of radians, right, this is zero, this is pi over two, this is pi, this is three pi over two, and this is two pi. Right. So in other words, I would have to, to find out, right, I already, I already got my reference angle, right, which is 1.23 in terms of radians, right, I would do two pi minus 1.23, right, to find what it is in quadrant four. 2 pi minus, minus 1.23. Uh, uh, remember, pi is just 3.14. Right. So I get here, right? 2 pi minus 1.23. This ends up being 5.05, right? So that, that, that's my other possibility. Theta is can also be 5.05, right? But, but what? But what? Look at your boundaries. You're told you're only able to use thetas between zero and pi, or in other words, between zero and 3.14. So this here, if we don't even need to use that, right? We, we don't even need to worry about that one. We can we only need to worry about that one. All right. Um, we said, right, well, whenever we're doing these boundary ones, right, we're gonna go ahead and do our number line. Right, you can do zero, one, two, three, pi, four, right? Because pi is just 3.14. To the right, to the left, I have this. Right, so I'm only able to use these values, right? I'm only able to use these between zero and pi, right? Uh, but I know that my critical points, right? The ones I can plug into the function are this, this here, right? My boundaries. And 1.23, right, which is the that new one that I found. So somewhere approximately here, right? So yeah, I may want to do the first derivative test so I can find out what is that? Is that going to be a minimum or a maximum, right? So my derivative was two minus six cosine theta, right? So let me go ahead and plug that in, right? I'm going to plug in G of one point. Oh no, I got to choose a point to the left and to the right, right? This is what, what, what I said, uh, this is the first derivative test. Right, so I'm gonna plug in probably one, and then I'll probably plug in two. Something pretty simple, right? It's uh, pretty pretty simple, right? So g of one, g prime of one, uh, uh, two minus six cosine of theta, right? In terms of radians, don't forget, right? We we have to be in radians radians for these, all right? Uh, it's a two minus six cosine of one radian. Right, this ends up giving me approximately negative 1.24, right? In other words, this is decreasing, right? I'm only worried about the, the sign. G prime of two, right? This is two minus six cosine of two, right? Two minus six cosine two in terms of radians. Uh, this gives me positive 4.49, right? Positive. So I know from here to here it's decreasing. Right, so in other words, I know that at 1.23 at that critical point, that's a minima. I, I know that right off the back, right? Uh, but I want to go ahead and plot these, right? I want to go ahead and plot these. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. With pi being somewhere there, and then negative one, uh, negative two, all right? And I know that my boundaries are between here and between pi. All right. Um, so we said I'm going to want to plug in zero into the original equation to it can spit out the y that I'm looking for. I'm going to plug in my critical point, which was 1.23. Then I'm going to plug in the other endpoint, the other boundary g, right, into the original equation, the two, um, the two theta minus six sine theta, right? Let's go ahead and plug that in and let's see what we get. Very nice. And I get these values, right? I plug in zero into the original equation. I got zero. 
I got, I plugged in 1.23 and I got that and I got the other ones, right? So in other words, plotting these points, right? This here is zero, zero. This point here is 1.23 comma negative 3.19. This point here is pi or right 3.14. 6.28 all right so meaning whenever i plug this in i get something like this i get 1.23 i get something what negative 3.19 and then at pi i got six point something so my graph looks something like this all right meaning this is my local min no this is my local max local max of zero at x equals zero my absolute min, right, of negative 3.19 at 1.23, and my absolute max, right, of 6.28 at 3.14, right? And right, that's how you go about those, right? That's how you go, go about those. Um, there is gonna be a word problem like this one, right? In this section, right? So make sure we, we go over this, right? And real quick, right, uh, mean value th theorem, right, mean value theorem. What we're doing with MBT, right, it's going to be, we're going to choose a point uh, A and B, right, and if I were to create an invisible line, I'm gonna, I can get a slope, right? My slope would be something like this, right? It's that orange line right there. Well, that means that at somewhere in that graph, I can only, always, I, I can also, I also have a tangent line at a specific C value, right? Where these two lines are parallel to one another, all right? So it's something, it's like a nice little trick, right? It's a nice little trick. Hey, if I can find, if I can create a, a slope between here and here, if I were to make this invisible string, somewhere along this graph, I should be able to create a tangent line, right? A, right, a tangent line. So let's go ahead and see how we do that, right? Let's go ahead and see how we do that, all right? So first things first, you're going to be giving a function, all right? So generally, what you're, what you're going to be finding is the formula is this. f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a, all right? So this is a two-parter, all right? There's going to be a two-parter. Uh, first things first, um, you want to find the secant, all right? You want to find that slope, all right? Um, so in other words, what you're doing here is um, identifying this here is your A point, this here is your B point, and you're plugging it into this function, right? So let's do this piece by piece, right? So this is going to be F of A, right? Which is F of negative five, which is six minus five times negative five squared. This gives me six minus five times 25. All right, now let's see what it, that ends up giving me. For my six minus, all right. Let's see what, one second. Negative one, one, nine, right? This is, uh, let me go ahead and find F of B, which is F of eight. Right, which is six minus five times eight squared is six minus five times 64. What does that end up giving me? Six minus five times 64. I end up giving negative three, one, four. And let me go ahead and plug that in now, right? Let's go ahead and plug it into, into this part. And let's go ahead and find that part first. All right. I get here um, that part, right? Uh, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, right? This ends up giving me f of b was negative 314 minus f of a minus minus 119 all over b. b was 8 minus negative 5. All right, uh, so negative 314 plus 119, this ends up giving me negative 195, uh, and eight plus five, right? That gives me, right, 
uh, this is the new 13. All right. And, and uh, where's the negative uh, 195 divided by 13? This here ends up giving me negative 15. Right. So in other words, this is just that yellow part. This is just the right part. Uh, you may be asking, hey, what is f prime of c? OK, so all I want you to do is remember, this is a derivative class. One way or another, we're going to have to apply the derivative. So this is a function that was given to me. All I need you to do now is take the derivative. Right? This is negative 10x. And last but not least, uh, very straightforward. Just change whatever x you have into a c. Oh, is that it? Yeah, that's it. All right. So now that you have this green part, right, we'll go ahead and call this uh, green part, right? Oh, well, we'll say this here is my yellow, all right? And we'll say this green part that you found is the other end, right? At this point, you equal both of these two one another. Uh, this is negative 10c is equal to negative 15. Oh, guess what? Solve for c. 10. Right, you see c is equal to negative 15 over negative 10, or c is equal to 15 over 10, or c is equal to 1.5. Okay, pretty nice, right? And that's it, right? That's, that's all I'm really gonna be asking you, right? Right. In other words, you, you, it's gonna be, it's gonna look like this, all right? You're gonna get examples like these, where it's the same thing, right? You find a derivative and you equal it uh, to the to the secant to the secant line, right? To, to the slope of the secant line. So, um, pretty straightforward. As long as you know the this formula, right? As long as as long as you know that process, right? As long as you know that process. Uh, for this one, I'll go ahead and get you started. You'd find out that your derivative here should be three over the square root of x, right? Um, six times x to the one over two x. Yeah, all right. Um, so yeah, you just, you just go ahead and go ahead and do that, all right? Um, and you plug in those values, uh, f of a minus f b all, all over b uh, minus a. Yeah, and, and, and it's going to be exactly that, all right? It's going to be exactly that. So all right, it's just a two parter, right? So in case you're asking, hey, what am I supposed to plug in? Right. In other words, how I've broken these uh, these up is the yellow part that you found out goes here. And after you solve this whole thing, right, the final, final answer, right, we'll do this in blue gamma juice blue, right? This final, final answer, whatever C is, right, you're going to plug it in, into that, right? Oh, and I had the solution there, right? 1.5. Right? It's right there, right? 1.5. Very nice. And last but not least, right, we're going to go ahead and, and look at Rolle's theorem, right? All right, so, so with Rolle's theorem, it's kind of similar to mean value theorem, right? Basically, what I'm going to be looking at is, let's just say, right, this is my Cartesian coordinate, and you have a function that you decided to cut off, just like the other one between here and here, All right? Where I have this secant line, right? Where there's this line that I've that I can connect. As long as I can connect these two, right? I connect these two, right? Meaning that there should be a tangent line up there, right? I'll also go ahead and say this: at the critical point, your slope is zero. If you haven't already made the connection, make that connection, right? Uh, how? Well, we know that the derivative at that certain point equals zero. The slope is zero there, meaning if your slope is zero at that point, I can tell you exactly at which point, right? Which is what we were doing, right? How to find critical points, right? Uh, how to find critical points, right? So that's pretty much all, we're, all that we're doing, but this time we're, doing we're going horizontal, right? And the rules for Rolle's theorem, right, must be, right, that A and B have to be continuous. From our previous section, right, this function must be continuous. There they, they can't be any holes there, right? It has to be smooth and continuous. Um, it also must be differentiable everywhere within that bound, right? It has to be differentiable uh, everywhere at that point, right? 
uh, at that entire piece, right, between here and here, all right. Also, you'll it must be right. Look at the y values to these two points. They're the same, meaning if you were to plug in f into a into the to to the original function, it should be the same answer as you were to plug in b into the original function. You should get the same thing. If it right, if if that happens, right, then you can continue with Rolle's theorem, right? Um, the conditions are met, right? It's co it's continuous on that function. It's differentiable at this function, and a all right, f of a is equal to f of b, right? Meaning, if if it passes all those steps, you're able to find f prime of c. You can exactly tell. I can exactly tell you what this x value is, right? If you notice with these, always two points are required, right? Uh, two, two points are, are required, right? So let's go ahead and, and find this, right? All right, so let's see here, right? So let me go ahead and get this space moved over. Okay, so this is a parabolic function, right? That is a parabolic function. All right, and it's positive parabolic. So that's gonna be going like this. It's a continuous function, all right? It's continuous and differentiable all the way there. Uh, you might be saying, well, what, was, what isn't differentiable between there and there? Uh, if you have sharp turns, right? Like absolute value functions, all right? So those are the ones you wanna uh, look out for, right? Because it's not differentiable at that point, right? So, so it is differentiable, right? It, and it is continuous there. Right, so the next thing I'm gonna find out is, does f of zero equal f of four? Well, let's find out, right? Um, let's plug in f of zero into the original equation. And this you'll find out gives me negative two. Plug in four into this original equation, right? This gives me two times four squared minus eight times four minus two. What does that give us, right? That is 16 times two. Let's go ahead and get this fixed. All right, right. That's two times 16. Ah, very nice, right? Two, um, this gives me two times 16. This is negative eight times four minus two, right? This ends up giving me negative two. Ah, so yes, it passes the third condition, All right? So it passes this one, it passes this one, it passes this one. If it passes those three conditions, I can now find that C value, right? And what I do here is I derive this function. I derive that function, right? My function is f of x equal to 2x squared minus 8x minus 2, meaning f prime of x is equals to 4x minus 8. Um, I know I need to equal this to 0, right? In other words, what I need to define first is f of c, and we know what that is. This c is over, and last but not least, right? You equal these to 0, right? you get your derivative and equal it to zero. So this is four C minus eight is equal to zero. Uh, four C is equal to eight, C is equal to two. Boom, all right. That's what would, or that is what is required of you, all right? This is what it would be, what would be required from you. I may give you one with Rolle's theorem, right? And I might ask you, right, um, which one of these conditions is not met, all right? This one, this one, or this one, right? And you need to know your functions, right? Uh, you need to know your functions. But if you know if it's a parabolic function, right? It is moving continuous, but all you would have to determine, hey, if we were to plug an A into there, um, do I get the same value as F of B, right? So um, this is all I have for you all today. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.